Hello, my name is Ellen Brogan and I would like to welcome you to webinar one of a two part webinar series on the application of ionizing radiation regulations in veterinary medicine. So the webinar series will outline what compliance looks like in the veterinary sector for both registrants and licensees. This is in order to provide guidance on fulfilling the legal obligations under the new ionizing radiation regulations 2019. So we will have a second webinar which will be held on Wednesday the 26th at 7 p.m. and during this webinar we will discuss findings from our remote compliance assessment carried out in 2022. We will also discuss what is involved in the inspection process and how to access Eden, which is the Environmental Data Exchange Network, where you can make changes. And this is where you can go to make changes to your license or registration. But today I will discuss the legal framework of the new ionizing radiation regulations, the authorization, in other words, registration or license and what each of the sections within the authorization cover. The roles and responsibilities of, rel of the relevant statutory roles listed in the ionizing radiation regulations. So these are the undertaking, the radiation protection advisor and the radiation protection officer. And then the new regulations, they also set out a requirement for a risk assessment, radiation safety procedures, radiation protection training, maintenance of equipment and an incident reporting procedure, which I will also discuss throughout this presentation. So in 2019, the ionizing radiation regulations came into force. And these regulations are based on findings from the International Commission on Radiological Protection and the Basic Safety Standards Directive. The Environmental Protection Agency is the competent authority responsible for the protection of workers and the public from exposure to ionizing radiation. So the Environmental Protection Agency created a document specifically for vets which is titled the Code of Practice on the Application of the Ionizing Radiation Regulations in Veterinary Medicine. And this code reflects the regulatory changes arising from the transposition of the European Basic Safety Standards Directive. It also reflects advances in veterinary technology and um, regulatory experiences that have happened since the 2002 publication of a veterinary code. So is, the new code was also prepared in consultation with a wide range of stakeholders. And it is also important to note that the code of practice on the application of ionizing radiation regulations in veterinary medicine is a legally binding document. So regulatory control, it is really intended to ensure that any risks associated with a radiological practice, these risks are effectively managed on an ongoing basis. So IOR 19, the Ionizing Radiation Regulations 2019, introduced several important changes. And this, these changes impact the way in which the EPA regulates the use of ionizing radiation in Ireland. And this includes a risk-based reg regulatory approach, which is comprised of four elements, which you can see on the slide. So firstly, the authorization. So this is the registration or license. It lays out conditions for safe use of x-ray equipment. All practices involving the use of ionizing radiation must be authorized in advance by the EPA. 
And secondly, guidance. So guidance documents and webinars are there to provide support to veterinary practitioners and others to understand and comply with the legal requirements of IRR 19. We have then compliance, compliance assessments or more commonly understood as inspections and we use compliance assessments to verify the level of compliance within a sector. And then finally enforcement, that is the final option available if compliance cannot be gained by any other means. And the risk-based ap approach means the greatest regulatory effort is directed towards higher risk activities. And so this approach informs each element, each of the four elements of the regulatory system. This risk-based approach, it applies to the authorization as well. So the authorization means it, it is a consent to carry out radiological practices. So the risk-based approach was termed graded authorization and it split the authorizations into registrations and licenses. So a registration is granted to undertakings who are considered to only have relatively low risk practices, whereas licenses continue to be applied to high risk practices. But irrespective of the form of authorization, all undertakings must carry out a radiological practice, all undertakings carrying out a radiological practice must fully comply with relevant provisions of IOR 19, the Veterinary Code of Practice, and any conditions that are attached to the registration or license. And so all authorization holders, both licensees and registrants, can be subject to compliance assessments, which include in-person inspections by the EPA. So practices which are subject to registration versus licensing. So registered practices, which are practices deemed to be a lower risk, this only includes general veterinary radiography carried out in a risk assessed veterinary clinic. Whereas licensable practices, these include general veterinary radiography performed in the field. And this is deemed to be a higher risk because there is less ability to control all operational conditions. So for example, exposure to weather events. And this really means that the chance of an accident or incident is increased and therefore is a higher risk practice and therefore is licensable. Veterinary nuclear medicine, that is also a licensed practice. So is veterinary fluoroscopy and veterinary radiography using a CT, as, as well as veterinary dental radiography, which uses a handheld intraoral unit carried out in a risk assessed veterinary clinic. And all practices which are relevant to your veterinary clinic must all be listed on your authorization. So if you carry out both general veterinary radiography in a risk assessed veterinary clinic and general radi veterinary radiography performed in the field, the higher risk practice will be reflected in your authorization. So therefore you will have a license. So these are just an example of the front cover of the registration and the license. So the authorization type is clearly listed on the front cover, so which I have circled on the slides. You can see cert certificate of registration or license. And then beneath this, the registration or license number um, will always begin with the letter L. And then after this, 
the main address for the veterinary practice will also be listed on the front cover. And it is important to note, undertakings must ensure that a copy of the front cover of the license or registration is displayed. And this must be displayed in a place where it is clearly visible to both staff members and members of the public. So the authorization is broken into sections known as schedules. And the registration and license, they do not contain the same level of information. And the license has schedules two and three, which does not appear on the registration. So in order to fulfill your legal requirements, the authorization must accurately reflect the present conditions within the clinic. So after the front cover, which I shown on a previous slide, you have table one and this lists, lists the practices which you are authorized to carry out. So for example, veterinary dental radiography using a handheld intraoral unit in a risk assessed veterinary clinic that is not listed in table one on the slide. And that would mean that this clinic is therefore not authorized to carry out the practice. So looking at the column headings then, grade refers to the level of risk attached to the practice. And then in other words, is it registered or licensed? And a registered practice will be authorized indefinitely. So from the day that the registration is granted. A licensed practice, however, is authorized for 10 years and then there it will be subject to a renewal process, which will be discussed next week. Now, looking closer at the schedules. Schedule one, it lists the authorization conditions and authorization conditions are a set of requirements which, which must be complied with. They must be complied with alongside IOR 19 and alongside the VET Code of Practice. Authorization conditions include, for example, general record requirements, conditions to be followed when purchasing a new X-ray unit, dosimetry conditions, the maintenance, quality and operational controls. And it is worth noting that the agency, the agency has begun a, re a review of license and registration conditions in line with IOR 19. So this is just to make you aware that some conditions, they may be updated in the coming future. And then Schedule 2, this only appears on the license. Schedule 2 lists the inventory of x-ray equipment. So the, premise, the premises is also noted in Schedule 2. So if you have multiple locations where you store different x-ray equipment, this will need to be reflected here. But for registrants, the requirement is that the registrant must maintain on file a record of the event of the inventory of x-ray units whereas for licensees they must maintain this inventory through Eden and then in other words the x-ray inventory will be listed on schedule 2. How to update this inventory again will be discussed next week. Schedule three, so this is where you name your appointed radiation protection officer. This is a veterinary practitioner or staff member working within the clinic. So I will go into further details in later slides on the role. But in summary, the RPO role, they are responsible for overseeing the implementation of radiation safety control measures. And again, this is now a statutory role with the introduction of IRR 19. But, but to mention, the undertaking still remains 
the one who is legally responsible for ensuring that radiation safety, for ensuring radiation safety within the clinic. Schedule three, it also names the radiation protection advisor you have consulted with. Consultations must only be sought from a list of EPA approved RPAs, which will be talked about in later slides. The RPA is an external consultant. And again, I will go into further detail about this. So as a registration holder, you do not have to name your RPO an RPA, and it will not appear on your registration. However, by holding a registration, you have declared that you have designated an RPO and that you have consulted with an RPA. So undertakings holding an EPA registration, they must retain on file documentary evidence which supports the self-declaration. The EPA may at any stage following the registration request copies of, this, of these supporting documents for the purpose of verifying the self-declaration. And then finally, Schedule 4, this lists all authorised premises. So for example, if you have a small animal clinic and a large animal examination space, and these are in two separate locations, they would both have to be listed here. Again, so this slide here is just a summary of everything I have discussed just highlighting the different requirements for registrants and licensees um, in respect of the radiological practices which are registered versus licensable, the duration that the authorization is valid for, schedule the scheduling the schedule of equipment, where that equi equipment inventory needs to be, and the requirements um, to name RPO and RPA. But again, it's worth noting, if you have both registered and licensed practice, you will have a license and are therefore subject to fulfill the requirements of a license. So I, on this slide here, I wanted to outline where you can find, find information on the regulatory requirements that you must adhere to and where you can go for further guidance. So on the left hand side side of the slide you have the regulatory requirements and then on the right hand side you have the guidance. Authorization con conditions, authorization again is the registration or license and the conditions are listed in schedule one as previously shown. And then all registrants and license licensees, they must adhere to IOR 19 requirements. And so I have included here a QR link to the new regulations. And then thirdly, the code of practice on the application of the ionizing radiation regulations in veterinary medicine, which I refer to as the VET code of practice. This really sets out in an easy to read format what the veterinary sector must do to comply with the legal requirements. The code of practice is a legally binding document and what this means is the requirements contained in the code of practice are legally enforceable. Then on the right hand side the IOR 19 guidance that that the guidance for undertakings on the application of ionizing radiation regulations. So this guidance sets out what compliance looks like for all sectors and therefore is not specific to the veterinary sector. It is also worth noting this is a guidance document and therefore does not hold the same weight as the code of practice. And as well, just to mention, all QR codes throughout the presentation 
they will also be listed as a web link in the final slide of the presentation if you are having any trouble with using those. So now moving on to the roles and responsibilities. So who is the undertaking? The undertaking is, for example, the veterinary practitioner or practice owner. And they are the person that has primary legal responsibility for compliance with the regulations and also the conditions of the authorization. And I have I have also indicated on the following slides where there is a requirement to maintain records. And I've done this with the icon on the bottom right of the slide. Uh, the undertaking has primary responsibility to ensure that records are retained. So the undertaking, they are responsible for ensuring that risks to staff members and members of the public from their activities are adequately assessed. This will be done in the risk assessment. The undertaking is responsible for implementing arrangements for the radiation protection of all staff and members of the public. They are responsible for designating a radiation protection officer and also responsible for providing them with appropriate resources, time and training. The undertaking must seek advice from a radiation protection advisor in order to ensure compliance with IOR 19. The undertaking is responsible for, for, for providing that radiation protection advisor with access, adequate information and facilities needed. The undertaking is responsible for ensuring that X-ray equipment is operated only by appropriately trained staff under, under the responsibility of a veterinary practitioner. They are also responsible for ensuring that X-ray equipment is appropriately installed, tested and subjected to quality assurance testing. They must also ensure that records and documentation are maintained, but that they are also accessible. And then this table here on this slide, it outlines the retention periods for records that must be maintained by the undertaking. So for example, you can see that risk assessments must be retained for two years following an update. Whereas training records, for example, for staff are required to be retained for at least five years. And then moving on to the radiation protection advisor. So who is the RPA? The RPA is a qualified expert. So they are an external consultant. And this expert is approved by the Environmental Protection Agency to give radiation protection advice pursuant to IOR 19. They are named on schedule three of the license and this is done through Eden. And this is covered as well under the self-declaration form for registrants. So the agency, the agency has reached out to our approved RPAs and we have compiled a list of radiation protection advisors which are available to provide services to the veterinary sector. So a full list of radiation protection advisors and their contact information can be found using the QR code and again there will be a link given in the final slide but the names of RPAs available to the veterinary sector which have confirmed their availability is listed on this slide. So when should a veterinary practitioner consult with a radiation protection advisor? <laughs> 
Firstly, at design planning stage. So this is just to note, if you do already have an authorization, you should have already consulted with an RPA at the de design and planning stage. And this is in breach of legislation if you have not contacted a radiation protection advisor. So at design planning stage, the RPA can advise on acquisition of or purchasing of new equipment and then acceptance testing around this new equipment. The preparation and update of both the risk assessments and local radiation safety procedures. The RPA can also advise um, on the design and shielding requirements for new buildings or facilities and then also the development of a quality assurance program for x-ray equipment. A radiation protection advisor, they should also be consulted as required. So this can be for dose monitoring and the outcome of the risk assessment will really say if consultation here is needed. And then as required for the review and update of the risk assessment, the risk assessment should be reviewed periodically or when any changes are made which impact work with the x-ray equipment. The RPA should be con consulted for quality assurance testing and they can assist in designing routine testing program. For radiation protection and ra the radiation protection officer training. So the RPA can provide training for new staff and also provide refresher training for any um, for any staff and this refresher training is required and staff staff training can be completed uh, with the RPA and this can take a day or even less. The radiation protection advisor they can also assist you in submitting an incident report if one does occur and this will be discussed in detail later and they can also provide you guidance when any equipment or facilities undergo changes. But just to clarify, once you consult with the Radiation Protection Advisor, they will be able to advise you on what areas your practice needs consultation with and what areas don't. So, the, so who is the RPO? So the Radiation Protection Officer is, for example, a veterinary practitioner or a nurse, and they are designated by the undertaking to supervise or implement radiation protection arrangements. So the RPO must report directly to the undertaking, but if you're a sole business owner, you are both the undertaking and the Radiation Protection Officer. So the Radiation Protection Officer, they must have sufficient knowledge, authority, time and resources to carry out the function. And they must also have a reasonable level of standing within the clinic. The Radiation Protection Function, the Radiation Protection Officer is now a statutory role. So they must be named on Schedule 3 of the licence. And again, this is covered under the self-declaration form for registrants. So the typical tasks and responsibilities for a radiation protection officer. These include liaising with the radiation protection advisor and also liaising with the Environmental Protection Agency. The Radiation Protection Officer is responsible for supervising and monitoring compliance with the radiation safety procedures and the implementation of the VET Code of Practice. The RPO is really responsible for checking if staff are following the radiation safety procedures for the clinic and also the procedures which are laid out in the veterinary code of practice. So the RPO periodically, they really must audit 
what staff are doing in practice and record and then record what what they have checked and keep this on file. And this can be a very simple exercise, but there must be a record to show that some action has been taken to monitor whether or not the procedures are being followed. Or followed. They must also monitor compliance with authorization conditions. The radiation protection officer is also responsible for the over, oversight of the safe operation of the X-ray equipment. They must provide or facilitate radiation safety training. So the RPO can provide training to other staff members, but additional training is required for the RPO role. So this specific training for the radiation protection officer role can be facilitated by the radiation protection advisor. And this can be done in less than half a day. And this can also be done in combination with training that the radiation protection advisor can give to all staff. The radiation protection officer, they must also maintain X-ray equipment records and relevant documentation. And then the roles and responsibility for veterinary staff. So the veterinary practitioner, they must ensure that procedure chosen, that the procedure chosen has the lowest risk consistent with clinical indications. They must also ensure that anyone carrying out a procedure is appropriately trained. And finally, ensuring that protective measures for staff and the public are both in place and followed. All staff have a responsibility to comply with the VET code of practice, and they all have a responsibility to utilize any personal protective equipment which is provided. So for example, wearing of a lead apron. So moving on to documentation, we will start with the risk assessment. So prior to using x-ray equipment, the undertaking veterinary practitioner in consultation with a radiation protection advisor, they must make an assessment of the nature and magnitude of the risks of exposure to ionizing radiation for both workers and members of the public. The, the risk assessment should act as the basis for all radiation safety. Each aspect of operation, storage, transport of equipment capable of producing ionizing radiation, including x-rays, they must be examined in the risk assessment. So the risk assessment should take account of fixed use of x-ray equipment and off-site or mobile use of x-ray equipment. The type of x-ray equipment that you have, the design and structure of the building, the occupancy of the clinic, who's behind each of the walls and the clinical layout. The risk assessment should also take account of routine and reasonably foreseeable workloads. How many x-rays would you take in a day, a week? The risk assessment should also take account of reasonably foreseeable incidents and accidents which can occur. So the risk assessment is really the foundation of your system of radiation protection. The risk assessment is fundamental to ensuring that exposures are kept as low as reasonably achievable. The risk assessment must be carried out in consultation with your radiation protection advisor. And it must be carried out for each practice, each location, and for transportation and storage of the x-ray offsite. The, the purpose of a risk assessment 
is firstly to identify both the severity and the likelihood of risks associated with normal operational use and also with reasonably foreseeable incidences. The risk assessment should also identify the operational control measures used to reduce this risk. The risk assessment is really the same idea as health and safety procedures. So identify where the hazards might arise and then to design the control measures or actions that need to be taken to reduce the risk caused by the identified hazards. So more specifically, the risk assessment should identify design me measures, so shielding or physical security and operational safety measures necessary to optimize radiation protection. The risk assessment should identify any personal protective equipment to be used, the signage requirements when offsite and in the clinic. The radiation safety measures which are to be taken in the event of an incident or accident occurring. And the categorization of exposed workers. Are workers likely to receive more than one millisievert dose per year? And where appropriate, the arrangements for personal dosimetry. And it is important that the risk assessment should act the risk assessment should act as a base a basis for all radiation safety each aspect of operation storage transport of equipment capable of producing ionizing radiation must be examined in the risk assessment so the risk assessment it must be reviewed periodically and maintained up to date so this review is to really make sure that the risk assessment is based upon current conditions in the clinic because safety procedures stem from the risk assessment. It is, of, it is fundamental that this stays up to date. The risk assessment should be thought of as a living document and automatically considered during changes. The risk assessment, it must be updated whenever there is a change to facilities, equipment or work practices which are liable to impact on radiological safety. So these may include a change in operational procedures, a change in the layout of premises or the occupancy function of an adjoining room, an increase in workload, the modification of equipment, the relocation of an x-ray unit, is it stored, is it used somewhere else? the purchasing or the purchasing of new x-ray equipment. So the risk assessment will indicate um, the requirements for personal protective equipment. Personal protective equipment, this can include lead aprons, gloves and shields, and they must be hung without folds. And radiographical examination, so examination with an x-ray of personal protective equipment should be carried out at regular intervals of no more than 12 months or more frequently if damage is suspected. So on to the classification of area gas. Again, the risk assessment will identify if there is a need to classify an area as controlled or supervised but the Radiation Protection Advisor, they will be able to advise you if this is necessary. So a controlled area is an area subject to special rules to which access is controlled, whereas a supervised area is an area subject to supervision. And for small animal radiography applications, classification of areas is not normally required. And when there are exposed workers, which I will discuss on the next slide, for example, large animal radiography or nuclear medicine, a risk assessment will determine the classification of areas.
So the risk assessment will also identify the need to classify a staff member as category A or category B. And a staff member will be an exposed worker who is a person who is liable to receive a dose exceeding dose limits for the public. And classifying as an exposed worker, they can be either category A or category B. And this indicates a legislative requirement to wear a personal dosimeter. Um, so even though there is a legislative requirement to wear a personal dosimeter as an expo for an exposed worker, this does not mean that uncategorized staff cannot wear a dosimeter for reassurance purposes if they wish. There is just no real requirement for this. But if you do, if there are both categorized staff badged and staff badged for reassurance in the clinic, please keep a record of what staff member fits into what bracket. Again, for small animal radiography, staff are unlikely to be categorized as exposed workers. Um, if large animal radiography is carried out, there is a higher likelihood of categorization. But again, the risk assessment in consultation with your radiation protection advisor will determine if there are exposed workers and if dosimetry is required. So if dosimetry is required, it is the responsibility of the undertaking to provide dosimetry monitoring and provide individual badges to exposed workers. The Radiation Protection Advisor will be able to advise on the type of dosimeter and the instructions for use, and this will be in line with the risk assessment. But in general, torso dosimeter badges should be worn high on the chest and outside lead PPE. There is a list of the EPA improved approved dosimetry services, and this is available on the EPA website through the QR code on the slide. Dosimetry records, they must be kept for no less than 30 years after the termination of work. Um, and then there are, there are maximum dose limits for workers and the public, and it is very unlikely that any veterinary staff will get close to exceeding these, but it is also important to be mindful that if work is carried out in multiple veterinary clinics, dose limits, they refer to the sum of all doses received in all clinics. And there is not a separate tally for each clinic. Now, moving on to the radiation safety procedures. So what are the radiation safety procedures? The radiation safety procedures uh, sets out the necessary operational measures to protect workers and the public from the hazards associated with ionizing radiation. And they must take into account the outcome of the risk assessment. If you have a fixed X-ray unit that is used in a designated X-ray room, then the code of, of practice can be used as your RSPs. But for all other scenarios and when indicated by the risk assessment, um, for example, using a mobile extra unit, even in different areas within the practice or out in the field, then local radiation safety procedures will need to be in, developed in consultation with an RSP or an RPA. So who are the radiation safety procedures for? The local radiation safety procedures and the code of practice must be made available to all relevant staff and a signed and dated log of this receipt must be available for inspection. The RSPs must also be followed by anyone carrying out and assisting with x-rays and animal owners must be made aware of risks associated with exposure and precautions to be observed before uh, the examination is carried out. Again, it is the responsibility of the radiation protection officer to monitor the compliance with these radiation safety procedures. So the, radi the general safety procedures for diagnostic x-ray examinations are set out in section 5.3 in the VET Code of Practice. And these RSPs are broken up into five sections. And this template can really be utilized to create your own 
local radiation safety procedures for the clinic where it's relevant, but the RPA will also be able to advise on the creation of RSPs. So in general, RSPs detail first when to take the x-ray. This ensures that exposures are optimised and unnecessary repetition is avoided. Second, preparing to take the x-ray, deciding the position, restraint of the animal, the personal protective equipment needed, and explaining risks to the owner if they are present. Three, taking the x-ray. So positioning of the operator or other personnel and positioning of the primary beam. Four, holding the animal. The animal really should not be held unless for clinical reasons, other means of immobilization is not possible. And if it is necessary, details of the steps to be taken to minimize risks from exposure must be included. And five, holding the image receptor. The image receptor should not be held unless specifically designed to be safely held by hand. And again, when this occurs, details of the steps to be taken to minimize risk should be included in the RSPs. And again, the risk assessment will determine the necessary procedural steps to be taken. So creating local radiation safety procedures, they must take account of, is it necessary to take the, the x-ray? What is the minimum number of x-rays possible? The position and restraint of the animal. The position, the position of staff and the public. Is the area suitably restricted to public access? and the risk assessment will determine the position which has the lowest risk associated. Is there a requirement for PPE? Do owners participating understand the risks and steps necessary to reduce the risks? Has the x-ray beam been collimated? Can staff and the public stand two metres away during the exposure? Always point the beam, the x-ray beam vertically if practical, but and if the animal must be held, have measures been taken to minimise the number of people holding the animal and to maximise the distance from the beam? Again, there is a template outlining this in section 5.3.2 of the Vet Code of Practice. And then for off-site examinations, the radiation safety procedures should also include details of site selection so using stables rather than an open field, avoiding areas with regular through traffic, ensuring that you can see the entirety of the examination area during the procedure, and selecting a site where access of unauthorised persons can be physically restricted. And site selection is done on an individual basis, but the code does provide some guidance on this. The RSPs for offsite examinations so also include the, the warning signs, bollards or cones that must be used to prevent access and what, what, what means are necessary to ensure the security of the x-ray unit during transportation to and from site. Again, the risk assessment will guide these steps. So this slide is just a summary of everything I have discussed, um, outlining the different requirements for registrants and licensees for the risk assessments and local radiation safety procedures. Again, if you have both a registered and licensed practice, you will have a license and therefore are subject to fulfill the requirements of a license. So, uh, radiation protection training for all staff. So whether you, hurt, you hold a license or a registration, staff should be appropriately trained. And it is the responsibility of the undertaking to provide this training. The training policy should include who is to be trained, what the training will cover. So in other words, the content of training, and training must really address the variety of radiological procedures that are carried out in the clinic. So, for example, it must include X-ray examinations in an X-ray in a dedicated X-ray room, and the use of a mobile X-ray unit in a stables or out in the field 
Uh, the training policy must also include details of role specific training for staff groups, which I will discuss more in the next slide. Um, the training content should really be broken up for the different staff groups based on their level of interaction with ionizing radiation. The policy should also include when the training will occur. So this is for both for new staff and for refresher training for current staff. And we recommend that refresher training occurs every three to five years, or if anything changes. The policy should also include the details of the training provider. So this is this can be the radiation protection advisor. And to note, the training policy can really be included in the radiation safety procedures document. Can, the training policy can be a one page or, or even less policy. And again, the radiation protection advisor will be able to help you to uh, create this document. So radiation protection training for staff. Um, radiation protection training for all staff includes the operational protection measures set out in the veterinary code of practice and those identified in the risk assessments. Um, training should also include the safety features of the x-ray equipment in use, procedures to be fo followed in the event of an equipment malfunction which is liable to have a radiological implication, um, and then also when it is appropriate, the possible risks to a fetus and additional protective measures during pregnancy. So additional radiation protection training for staff which are categorised as exposed workers. And again, that is a person who is liable to receive greater than one millisievert dose per year. This training should include the general principles of radiation protection related to their working environment, the health risks created by an exposure to ionizing radiation, and then also the importance of the risk assessment and the importance of staff inputting into the risk assessment development and continued maintenance. And as previously mentioned, the radiation protection officer requires additional training for the role. And this training includes the legal responsibilities and duties of the radiation protection officer. The training must also include an understanding of the relevant legislation, so IOR 19, and the code of practice. And then the training must finally include an understanding of the license or registration conditions. So, um, for installation, maintenance and disposal of equipment. An EPA approved service engineer can, can carry out all testing and maintenance on x-ray equipment. And if you want, if you want to do this, if you want to pass responsibility for radiation protection to the service engineer, they must hold an EPA authorization for the installation and servicing of radiological equipment. And this allows for a transfer of responsibility as long as clear contractual arrangements are in place, which detail the handover of responsibility and the designation of controlled areas. So firstly, when purchasing a new x-ray, acceptance tests are required and these tests verify that the equipment functions appropriately, safely and in accordance with the manufacturer's specifications. Acceptance tests also verify that any safety requirements which are mentioned in the risk assessment, for example, shielding or beam orientation, they have been implemented, among other things. And when buying new X-ray equipment, the undertaking must maintain an up-to-date inventory, which includes the locations. And this is on Schedule 2 for license and retained on file for registrants. So the undertaking must also arrange for routine surveillance of all equipment performance. And this is in order to monitor its functioning. So equipment really must 
be maintained in good working condition and maintenance must identify any defects or faults and correct those as soon as possible. So the undertaking must ensure that a written report is provided following all installation and servicing work and this report must be retained on file. The report should be signed by a representative of the installation or service company and by the undertaking or a representative of the undertaking. And then when it is necessary to dispose of an x-ray, appropriate measures must be put in place to ensure that the equipment cannot be switched on inadvertently when not in use. And the EPA guidance note must be followed to ensure compliance with WE regulations and EPA requirements. And the guidance note is on um, how to properly dispose of X-ray equipment. And a record must be maintained of all the X-ray equipment that is disposed of. So a service engineer will verify voltage, radiation output and exposure times. And these tests are to be repeated every three years. All other quality assurance tests can be done by a competent person in the, within the clinic. And these quality assurance tests include checking that the radiation field aligns with the edge of the light field, checking for any deterioration in image quality since the previous quality control, a visual check of mechanical functions, emergency switches, warning lights, etc. And then also a visual check of radiation shielding. And all of these internal checks must be carried out once a year. And again, a record must be kept of all testing that is carried out. So um, on to reporting of incidents. An incident involving the use of X-ray equipment must always be reported to the EPA. But what is a reportable incident? This is any incident involving the exposure of any person arising from a design flaw or an incorrect operation of equipment, the theft or loss of an X-ray equipment, and any incident involving a dose or suspected dose in excess of any dose limits for staff or members of the public as specified in IRR 19 or any inappropriate or unauthorised use of x-ray equipment. So how should an incident be reported? The undertaking is responsible for the reporting and that we advise that you report the incident to us by email um, with the email address Radiation incidents at epa.ie. Incidents can be reported by telephone, but this is only during office hours and only really recommended if you have an urgent query. So call the number on the slide and then ask to be transferred to the Radiation Protection Regulation team. So after an incident is reported, the incident investigation aims to identify. Firstly, the sequence of events that led to the incident, the causes of the incident, what remedial action is necessary to prevent a reoccurrence, and the estimated doses received by all persons involved in the incidents. Incident investigations, they must always involve the undertaking, the exposed person, the X-ray operator, and the RPO and RPA. And then once the incident investigation is carried out, the incident report must include the key facts concerning the incident, the consequences, if any, for the individuals exposed, what recommendations are there to avoid a reoccurrence, and details of any follow-up action to be taken with exposed individuals. So this incident report shall be signed and dated by the undertaking and the person who prepared it and then forwarded 
to the EPA, but a copy of this incident report must be kept on file. So the undertaking, as previously stated, is primarily responsible to make and fully maintain relevant records to demonstrate compliance with IRR 19. And, and the undertaking must have these records accessible when required by the EPA. And this table outlines the retention period. So we have now come to the end of our webinar. Um, uh, but before the Q&A session begins, I would like to remind anyone who is not yet registered for webinar two. Um, it is the same time, so 7 p.m. next Wednesday, the 26th. Uh, please register um, through the link provided on the slide. Uh, 